1957, classified as a first felony offender, offense, second degree battery, sentencing date, November 6, 2019, sentence to five years. Parole date is July 5, 2021. Good time date is January 5, 2022. Full term is November 5th, 2024. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, yes, it is. Mr. Wise. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, at this time, uh, what programs have you been taking, Mr. Williams? Uh, the only pro uh, program that I've taken is uh, the re-entry program. That's the only one I think you're doing. You've never took no victim victim awareness or anything like that, anger management? I tried to get an anger management class, but they said I was uh, of low risk and they wouldn't let me get into another class. Okay, when was, uh, what do you do there at the facility where you're at, your house, West Baton Rouge? What I do at, at, at my home? Uh, no, in ba West Baton Rouge, we're your house at right now. Oh, Are you okay. a trustee? Yes, I'm a trustee. I work in the, in the garden. In the what? In the garden. Oh, in the garden? Yes. So during this time, during this time you've been incarcerated, uh, how long have you been incarcerated total? Uh, from November the 6th of 19 till now. That's about a year and 10 months. Okay. I know we have a lot of people that's going to be speaking today, and I, I will, uh, and I'm going to try to address them as much as I can. But at this time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let this, uh, your attorney, Ms. Karen Green, is that correct? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Ms. Green? Hi. Hello, I can't hear. I can't hardly hear you there. Uh, is is this better? Yes, ma'am, it's better right there. Uh, Miss Green, is there anything you'd like to say on his behalf, or you gonna wait to the end to close? Uh, I think I'll wait to the end. Okay. Also, I see uh, Speaker Felicia Jet and support there. Uh, if you would unmute your mic. Anything you'd like to say? Yes, absolutely. My name is Williams, who is with me on the who's having technical difficulties. Okay. So I have two brothers that are with me to speak on the behalf of Mr. Jerry Williams. One again is Mr. Terry Jett. And the other is Mr. Ronnie Williams, Reverend Wright, Ronnie Williams. So is it okay to allow them to speak? Uh, no, ma'am, they did not register to speak this morning. So only those who gave their names this morning can only allow three speakers for each part and uh, 10 minutes between three speakers, okay? Okay, well, I registered for Mr. Terry Jett to speak this morning. So okay, can so Terry speak this morning? If, if he registered this morning, yes, ma'am. I thought you had extra people there with you that you were trying I, to- I do, I do have a second person also available. Okay, no, ma'am, it'll just be, just be the one name there, okay? Yes, ma'am, okay. Thank you so much. I can speak now? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I just wanna to speak uh, to my brother's behalf that he has been an excellent brother, a great man. Uh, very good man in society, hardworking. Uh, he'd been working on his job for 20 years at the present job that he was on. A uh, very stable person. Uh, he was living at the address he had been living for 25 years where he bought a home. And that um, he's just been a, a person with great character. And I think um, that throughout this whole ordeal, um, it's been very stressing on him, but I think he's aware of everything that's been going on and he's uh, ready to move on and uh, have a better life and make a better life for himself. Okay, thank you very much. I see uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, you would unmute your mic, speak. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. 
Okay. Uh, how you doing? My name is uh, my name is Tasman Mitchell, and uh, I'm currently a LSU basketball assistant basketball coach. And um, Coach Jerry was my he was my first found love in the sport of basketball. You know, he was my mentor throughout for, since I was seven. He was my first coach, and he's the he's really the reason why I'm into coaching today. Why I love the game and why I was so successful in the game. You know, after every one of my games, he used to. I used to call and ask them and 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 ask them to critique me about my everyday life, about my game and stuff like that. And he would do so. But first thing, first thing, the last thing he would always say, man, I'm so proud of you. And I used to tell him that I'm so proud of you as well for for just finding the heart and the favor to mentor a child like me who didn't grow up without his father, who grew up without his father and um, and everything, man. Like, we used to spend a night by his house all the time. Me and his son, his stepson, we were, like, best friends. And, you know, and 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 he used to always support me when I when my LSU games and stuff like that. Like I say, at the end of the day, you know, um, mistakes were made. You know, mistakes were made. But at the end of the day, you know, everybody deserves a second chance. You know, I love him to death. I love him with all of me. He's like my, he's like my father in my life. You know, and, and 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 I care for him so much. That's why I had to step out of practice. I stepped out of practice to talk to him, to talk on his behalf. You know, I kind of cut my job aside because this is. I feel like at the end of the day, this is more important. You know, giving give, giving my one of my father figures a second chance at life. You know, he's a he 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 always opened his home to me. And when I used to have when when I used to have like questions that, that my mom couldn't answer. You know, that my mom can answer. I used to go to him all the time and ask him just just growing up, not even about the basketball field or nothing like that. It was just just everyday life, like a father figure in my life. And I think me personally, deep down inside, you know, I love to see him in the stands <laughs> at one of my games here, you know, coming up. And 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 I just love him to death. And I think he does, you know, I think it, everybody deserves a second chance. He's he's an awesome man and I love him to death. And I just think he deserves a second chance. So I'm here on his behalf just to tell him I love him and hope y'all find favor to give him a second chance. Okay, Mr. Mitchell, thank you very much. At this time, Ms. Barbara, if you would unmute your mic. Uh, okay, you're unmuted. I believe she's froze up there. Ms. Barbara, can you hear me? Hello? At this time, if uh, we would, we'll move on to the victim today. Uh, I think she's froze up or something's happened to her computer. If we would, we'll go on to the victim here. Veronica O'Connor, if you would unmute your mic and you can speak. Anything you say, say it to the board. Yes, sir. How you doing? You can hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a statement written that I'm going to read out. My name is Veronica O'Connor. I was the victim in the case of State of Louisiana versus Jerry Williams. February of 1996, at the age of 17, I was raped by Jerry Williams by a man that was old enough to be my father. Nobody could begin to understand what I went through that night. This man forced himself on me. Jerry Williams forced himself inside of me, even when I said no. I was telling him no to please stop. My pleading did not matter to Jerry Williams because Jerry Williams never did stop and the pain got only worse. My body felt like I was paralyzed, scared to move, terrified that I would get hurt worse than what I already was. I remember the tears rolling down my face, the pain in the pit of my stomach. I closed my eyes and I thought if I didn't see what was happening, then just maybe the pain would stop, but it didn't stop. Jerry Williams forced me even to do oral sex on him. He held my head tight so I couldn't pull away. I couldn't understand what I did wrong at the age of 17 to deserve something like this. The things that go through your mind when you're being sexually assaulted or unbearable. I was praying that I was gonna still be alive to see my mama or my family because I had no idea what was going to happen next. You feel, I'm sorry. 
You feel your entire world shattering and you can't do nothing. When it was all over, he threw me a towel and told me to go in the bathroom and take a shower. When I came out, I told him, when I came out, he told me, come on, I'm dropping you off. As I was getting out the car, he told me, I better not say nothing to no one. Not only was I raped on this night by Jerry Williams, but Jerry Williams also stole from me. The one thing that I controlled as a female was took from me. He took my virginity, something that a female holds sacred. I was never gave the opportunity to be able to give myself to the man of my choosing. Instead, Jerry Williams made that decision for me. I was no longer able to make that decision for myself. I had always been taught to save yourself for marriage, that sex before marriage was a sin. My beliefs were stolen from me in a horrific act. For the longest, I felt dirty and ashamed of my own self. I would take shower after shower, trying to scrub the filth off my body. I didn't want to leave the house or be around anyone. I was scared of people. If a person I didn't know could hurt me, then what could someone that I do know do to me? I shut down completely and went into a deep depression. I was scared to sleep because I had nightmares. I went through anxiety and panic attacks. I would cry for hours and hours. I got to the point to where I was questioning God, something that went totally against my beliefs as well. But I couldn't understand why God allowed me to get hurt when he's supposed to be the one person that loves me most. My depression got so bad that I actually tried to take my life. I just wanted the pain to stop. My mom found me after I took a bottle of pills. I ended up in a hospital for about a week to be put on suicide watch. As time went, I started to heal, but not fully. Rape is something that you never fully get over. No matter how many years go by, it's always in the back of your head. I finally learned how to live my life. I learned how to put a little trust back into people. I learned that my life still had meaning. And I had so many people that were standing behind me and were supporting me through these times. Finally, my life got a little bit of normalcy again. Then 20 years later, at the age of 37, I got a knock on my door. I was just sitting in my house doing my work, not realizing my life was about to be shattered again. There was two detectives from Baton Rouge. When I opened the door, my heart dropped because I thought something had happened to a family member. When they came inside, they spoke to me, let me know they was there about a report that had been filed in 1996. They never told me what it was that was filed. Instead, they made me remember and tell them. I had managed to push the rape to the back of my mind for years. And within seconds, everything happened to me came flashing before me once again. I felt like I had been raped a second time. I just broke down crying. I felt like I was just raped again. All them emotions and anxiety hit me once again. I didn't know what to say to the detectives. My body went into shock. I couldn't believe that I was going through this again. When he was finally arrested and I saw it on the news and I saw his face again after 20 years, all I could remember was that face looking at me while he was raping me. This was the man that turned my life upside down. I lost my mind that night, literally. My boyfriend could not get me to calm down. I was shaking, crying, and went into a panic attack. I had a nervous breakdown again. Once again, I locked myself away from everyone. I just didn't want no dealings with the outside world. My nightmares came back and the restless nights came back. I was once again feeling dirty. My business went down. I couldn't even work to keep my business going. I started to lose my income slowly. I went back into a deep depression I couldn't get myself to come out of. I was scared to let my six month old little girl out of my sight. I tried counseling twice while I was going through the court procedures, but that didn't seem to help. We went through court for over three years and it was a long, hard three years. Having to face Jerry Williams in court was hard. I was finally able to get some justice when Jerry Williams was sentenced to the five years. Now I'm here a third time, but this time for a parole hearing. I have been given a life sentence from this rape. I will never be able to escape the emotions, the pain from the rape. Some days are good days, while others I just want to be alone and cry. 
I have a lifetime of healing ahead of me. The thing is once you are raped, it scars you in so many ways. The biggest is the emotional scars. You try to bury the pain and lock it away, but it is forever there in the back of your mind, never knowing when the pain is going to resurface and mess with your life. You really never feel whole again. I have done been put on an antidepressant Prozac and a sleeping medication Ambien in order to try to help me function day by day. I have to take medication now for depression caused from this rape. My life has been changed dramatically and all I can do is take it day by day, hoping and praying that the next day is better than the day before. I am asking the parole board to please con consider, I have been through a lot, how Jerry Williams changed my life when he raped me over 25 years ago, when I was only 17 years old. I deserve justice from Jerry Williams' actions. I am praying that Jerry Williams' parole is not granted today, that I get the justice that I so deserve for this rape and the emotional stress and depression Jerry Williams has inflicted in my life, as well as the pain that he has caused many people in my family. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening to my feelings today. I really appreciate it. Mr. Wise, Mr. Wise. Yes. I have a couple of questions for Ms. O'Connor. Uh, Ms. Okay. O'Connor, Ms. O'Connor, what was the situation? Uh, did he break into your home or apartment or you attacked? How, how were you? In, how was it that you were in the company of Mr. Williams? I was picked up by him off from Government Street. Okay. He was giving you a ride? Yes, sir. And yeah. instead of taking me where I was supposed to go, we ended up at his house. Okay. Okay. Do you usually take rides from strangers? At the age of 17, I didn't really, at that time, realize that you could really get hurt by somebody outside of your home. I was, I was more isolated from people as a kid. Thank you, Ms. Uh, O'Connor, for answering my questions. Thank you. Mr. Wise? Okay, thank you very much. Also, I see the speaker, Barbara, you want to try it again and see... You was going to try to speak and you froze up a while ago. Unmute your mic. Unmute your mic. I did, sir. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead and give your statement. Okay. My name is Barbara Robertson. Um, I am a retired from the uh, city of Baton Rouge. I work for Baton Rouge City Court in the judicial system for 25 years. I've been knowing Mr. Williams the entire time that I've worked at the court. He's married, his brother is married to my daughter, my oldest daughter. Um, I've not known anything but a man that was really quiet, stayed to himself. I had um, the unpleasure, unpleasurable incident of my husband dying of a heart attack four years, four years ago, a little over four years ago. And it was like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night when we got to the hospital. I looked up, Mr. Williams was one of the uh, first 10 people to get there to comfort me and my daughter and my family. Um, he's been a great friend of mine. I was just really surprised and stunned when I heard of this event of um, him being arrested for something that had happened many years ago, probably prior to me knowing him. I've not known his character to be anything but a quiet, easygoing, easy to get along with person that loves his son. He has a 90 some year old mother and my son-in-law and he are just inseparable. My family um, is well, we're Christian living, ab law abiding citizens. And I just would have never guessed from his dominion, uh, his, his, him being with us and hanging around us, 
that I would that anything like this could have ever happened. I know that he has to be sorry he served some time. I know him and his family, and I know that he would have learned a lesson from this and that he's never done anything close to what he's been accused of. So I pray that you would consider that we all make mistakes. And you know, I know we're not supposed to use the Bible, but God said if we would ask 40 times a day for it and, and honestly repent of our sins, he forgive us. And I just feel sorry for the young lady. I hope she can move on with her life and have a prosperous, successful, content life. Okay. Thank you for allowing. Thank you. You started freezing up at the end, but thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll let Mr. Williams anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote. Uh, my name is Jerry Williams. I I'm just overwhelmed by this. I'm. You know, I know I made a mistake by getting involved in this situation, but a lot of it, I just don't know where it come from. Um, but I, I apologize for just being in the situation, period. I mean, I, I was told she was 19, but wound up to 17, but I, I just, I wish every day that that would have never happened. And from that day to this day, nothing like that has ever come up, come into my life and I wouldn't let it come into my life. You know, I just hope and pray that y'all can understand the whole situation and give me a second chance. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Green. Yes, uh, first, did you all receive this uh, statement uh, Mr. Williams had me to prepare on his behalf? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to know so that, you know, I don't want to have to go into too many details, but um, I just wanted to, you know, remind the board that this was some allegations that was alleged to have occurred in 1996. At the, and at that time, you know, there were med medical reports, you know, that showed certain evidence. And at that time, Mr. Williams was you know, investigated. Uh, he was questioned by the police. Um, Mr. Williams wasn't forthcoming as he needed to be at that time, which he deeply regrets because even if you tell a small lie or a big lie, it, it'll come back to hunt you. It, eventually, it may be 20 years later, it'll come, you know, it could come back to come back to hunt you in a way that it should. But, um, he fully cooperated with investigators. Uh, he, he, he didn't, you know, hide or, or run from the law at that time. And for over 20 something years later, for him to be prosecuted uh, is interesting enough. But he was a totally different person than he was at the time of prosecution than he was in 1996. Um, he's at, at the age that he was even prosecuted at. He's much wiser. Um, he had already worked over 20 years in a career, in which he ended up losing his job because of these charges. He's 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 lost a lot. He has lost a lot. And um, again, my my sympathy goes out to Miss Connor. My sympathy goes out to Mr. Williams. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no other questions there. I'd like to go into executive session on this. I second. I second. Noon, I'm waiting for the hearing room to pop up. It had, I don't see them at the hearing room yet. They're there. Okay. Okay, at this time, well, we'll go ahead and do our vote. We've already heard from each and every one. Today, I looked over this. This is a very serious case. And Ms. Green uh, and uh, Mr. Williams, I want y'all to listen real well as I vote now. My vote is today to grant you parole after you complete victim awareness and also anger management. 
because you have a low risk and you have an outdate. Uh, you have an outdate on your good time date will be in January of, uh, let me see, January 5th of 2022 this year will be your out date. But if you get those, get those classes under your belt, it'll be different. That's my vote. Ms. Pearl. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, my vote is to grant as well. You have a low needs assessment. Uh, we have a, you have a low risk assessment. Uh, I note the letter from your, um, from Sergeant about how well you are adjusting in jail, how you're working in prison. We, I, I want to note that for the record. We did get a positive letter uh, from the staff. You have outstanding community support and family support present at the hearing. And uh, I am, uh, and my, you know, my condolences to the victim and all that you, uh, and I thank you for your presence today, for your bravery and your courage today. But my vote is to grant after you complete the anger management and the victim awareness. Best wishes to you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Roche. You have a good time date of uh, January 5th, 2022, only what, three months and a couple of weeks. I want you to take these programs to aid in your rehabilitation so you know how the victim is feeling today. Victim awareness will enlighten you on what type of feelings that victim has. And the anger management will serve you well. The good time that you earn in those two programs will probably make you an automatic release once you finish those programs. After the programs, you'll have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I want you to uh, maintain some employment so that you can stay busy. And you are to have no contact whatsoever with the victim or any member of that victim's family. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Robinson, this time uh, the vote was to grant to your parole after you complete anger management and victim awareness program and all the conditions stated. Thank you all very much. And I have a quick question. Is there a certain pro anger management victims awareness class you would like him to take or is it any one that we find in the community okay? The one, he's got to do this while he's incarcerated. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And they'll take care of it there at the uh, place where he's at. So we know that's taken care of, Ms. Green. And we appreciate you doing a great job today. And they'll get on it as quick as they can after we tell them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wise, can I please adjourn for the What did we just watch? I, I seriously, I, I'm, I have information that I'm going to unpack with you. And having the information now in what I'm about to share with you still makes me left completely dumbfounded. They sentenced him to just five years he's getting out after just a couple of years on good time it's being insinuated that he didn't do anything wrong i don't know how they come up with that conclusion based on the facts of the case, based on the testimony of the victim, of the survivor, what they're stating by this sentence is that they don't believe her. 
is that they believe she made it entirely up. Now, we will go. We have the information. But I do want to point out before we go over that information, how ridiculous, how in this these interviews were. I mean, first, I, I was standing on my toes, nervous with anxiety that Jim Wise was going to cut her off. And thankfully, he did not. So I'll give the credit where it's due. Pearl Wise also seemed to be listening to her, which is nice to see. But to have to listen to his supporters, the speaker, Barbara, to come on after the survivor speaks and shamelessly say the things that she said, telling the victim to forgive telling her to move on with her life in so many words, then clapping and laughing and smiling as he was getting paroled. Remember, this hearing was absolutely unnecessary to begin with. He had a good time day just around the corner. What we just saw, in my opinion, is the, is. Everybody saying that the victim, that the survivor lied, which makes no, I don't know how you can come to that determination. It seems the judge felt that way. It seems the DA felt that way. It seems that everyone in this room felt that way. But he's not such, he's not a prince. He's not a good guy. The reason that they took his DNA was because he was charged with another offense. He had a he had he was arrested in 2015 for an unrelated domestic abuse battery charge. He was required to submit DNA. His attorney, what his attorney said was absolutely disgusting. I, I thought that was one of the more unprofessional attorney statements that I have heard, not just in Louisiana, ever. Allegations alleged to have occurred in 1996. He's in prison. It's not alleged. And at that time, he wasn't forthcoming. Even if you tell a lie, it will come back to haunt you. Then she goes on to say, he fully cooperated. No, he didn't. He lied. Then she says, over 22 year, 20 years later to be prosecuted is interesting enough. He has lost a lot. He has lost so much. He has lost his job. He has lost a lot. So what are you saying? He's sitting in prison from DNA evidence. My sympathy goes out to the victim and to him. What if, what is wrong with you? And then Jim Wise compliments her on her on how she handled the case. It was terrible. And she said she submitted information to them. We'll go over the information and we can try to come up to some conclusion. Although, frankly, after hearing her speak, after hearing her speech, I, I, I can't, I cannot take the back of a man who's sitting in prison and who has that charge on him to get him there. And what he says his final words, I apologize for being in the situation. I thought she was 19, but she was 17. You're 17 is a consenting age, first of all, and you're not in prison because she was 19 or 17. You're in prison because what you did to her. It was the most unremorseful speech that, well, not the most. It was bad. It's on the top of the list. 
And everyone in the room is acting as if he was falsely accused for something he didn't do. We'll go over the information now, starting with this. I've helped Baton Rouge police solve a 20 year old rape case. 59 year old Jerry Williams was arrested for allegedly raping a Denham Springs woman back in February of 1996. According to police, Williams was recently arrested for an unrelated charge and had to submit DNA. Police say his DNA was a match for the old rape case. Investigators had questioned Williams at the time, but he never faced charges. Now he's being held at the EBR Parish Prison. Okay, I'm going to try sharing it on a Google Doc so we don't need to look at ads. And also there were some like addresses put in there and I wanted to remove it because um, you just never know with YouTube, even an address that's 25 years old, you don't know what they're going to do. So I'm trying to play it safe, but I'll put the link to the original article in the description below. And thank you, Richard, for sharing all of this information. This is a pretty good account. We're going to go over it and we'll, well, let's go over it. A 59 year old man in East Baton Rouge parish prison on account of second degree sexual assault after DNA from an unrelated arrest in December matched a Baton Rouge teenage girls kit taken two decades ago, leading detectives to re-examine the case. Now, Jerry was questioned by detectives in February of 1996, about two weeks after a 17-year-old girl arrived at a hospital and told doctors and detectives that she'd been assaulted by a man at his Baton Rouge home, according to the police report. At the time, though, Williams told detectives a different version of what happened inside his home, claiming the woman initiated a sexual encounter but that the two never actually had sex, according to the report. And in my opinion, this is the lie, the little lie that caught up to him, uh, according to his attorney, right? You know, if he had just said that he had had sex, then they wouldn't get him, right? After interviewing Williams, detectives couldn't get back in touch with the victim. So that's where... That's where we have, I guess, our first maybe issue. So they interviewed Williams, but they couldn't get back in touch with the victim. But I am pretty sure that you will hear many victim advocates say that that is not entirely un, uh, an irregularity, right? Um, especially remember there's a warrant cell phone. So they would have to go to her house. Maybe they made a couple of attempts. They gave her the number she she's just going to through too much trauma and just doesn't doesn't follow through and i'm sure that's more common than people think or assume right so you, you but but there's there is something that they have don capola baton rouge police department spokesman so the case sat large largely so it stopped because of her according to them at least so the case sat largely dormant for 20 years until williams wound up being swapped for dna uh at a parish prison because he's such an angel he's such a good guy he's so quiet he showed up when my husband died first one there huh, i wonder why at december after baton rouge police arrested him on a domestic abuse battery count right now, once state police crime lab analysts enter Williams' DNA into a computerized database, they got a match up on a DNA collected during the teenage victim's assault exam in 1996. At the time, the victim told investigators that she was walking on St. Rose Avenue after leaving a group home on Government Street about 6 p.m. February 9, 1996 when she saw five men at a house and asked for a ride to Denham Springs, the police report says. One of the men, Williams, said he needed to go to Denham Springs to pick up his son later that evening and would give her a ride. Williams, who was then 39 years old, drove her in his brown station wagon to a fast food restaurant on Plank Road because the girl was hungry. 
Then he took her to his house off North Foster Drive, the report says. After the two ate, the girl lay down on the couch to watch TV. Now, remember, this is his account. Oh, actually, no, this is so this is her account. After the two ate, the girl lay down on the couch to watch TV. The teen told police Williams got on top of her. And when she tried to push him off, Williams said to her, I can't believe this. I am nice. You should give me something in return, according to the report. She told police William forced her to perform oral and then assaulted her. And afterwards, he drove her to Denham Springs and dropped her off at a bank on Range Avenue. The victim ran to a relative's house and was taken to a hospital. When detectives questioned Williams in 1996, 15 days after the encounter with the girl, he claimed the victim had taken off her pants at his house. So he's saying, no, she came over, she took off her pants while he was in another room using the telephone. Williams told investigators he had limited sexual contact with the girl because he had no protection with him. So there's his 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 lie that uh, that his attorney was talking about. The alleged allegations that his attorney was talking about. Coppola said detectives attempted to speak with the victim again just over two weeks after she filed the initial report but weren't able to get in contact with her. 20 years later, on January 14th, state police alerted Baton Rouge police that Williams' DNA profile matched the semen in the victim's kit, prompting investigators to get in touch with the woman. Baton Rouge detectives located her in a neighboring parish and met with her, the police report says. The woman, who became very emotional as she recounted the events, confirmed she filed the report in 1996, according to the report, and told the detectives that she didn't know Williams before the day that he did that to her. On Friday, police obtained an arrest warrant who was booked the following day. Now, this is where the information goes cold. This is where we don't have, you know, he took a plea deal. We don't, there's, he never appealed it. But I don't understand. She has her account. He has his account. Yes, she took a ride with him, got food, ended up in his house. Now, it's very possible that he said, hey, I'm going to go get something to eat. And she said, okay. And then, hey, I got to get something at my house. And she said, okay. Right? Those events are possible. If she's naive, <laughs> if she's trusting, it was a little bit different back then. He got just a five-year sentence, and they ran the parole hearing like everything she said was not true, and all he did wrong was lie about the intercourse, which was sexual assault. Even if she took her pants off, it would have been if she had said stop, right? But why would you even believe his side of the events? We have people that are getting locked away today for accusations that occurred 30 years ago where there is zero proof or evidence, just their words, their statements. And here you have DNA. And you have a victim who is clearly traumatized. What you have when you break it down is a 17-year-old victim who says she was sexually assaulted by this man. She, she went to the hospital immediately after it had happened, filed a police report, he denied that it happened. DNA then proved that he was lying. And he only got five years.
And he served a fraction of it. And the victim was meant, was made to feel like she was lying. At this hearing, that was my takeaway. The attorney implicated that. The board didn't challenge her attorney on that. His final statements implicated that. The board didn't challenge him on that. She was left alone. In my opinion, this is the epitome of a broken system. This is the epitome of a survivor being re-victimized. You can't make it up. You really can't. With that, I'll let you go.